On Wednesday night, we're talking about uh, actually false teachers and false doctrine. I'm not just trying to go out after people and give them a hard time, but Jesus called down false teachers. He called the Pharisees, which were the most religious men of the day. He looked at them and called them children of hell. He said, he called them children of the devil. He said, your father's the devil. The works of your father you will do. They said, our father's Abraham. He said, he's not your father. I know you are of the seed of Abraham, but if he were a father, you would do the works of Abraham. And Jesus also told them that they were, he said to them, he said, you woe unto you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. This is in the 23rd chapter of Matthew. Woe unto you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You compass sea and land to make one proselyte. And after he's made, you make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. I could go into that. I start, I start to, but I'm not going to. They preached the halakha, which was a twisted word of God. The halakha eventually developed into the Talmud, just a perversion of the word. So Jesus was saying, you're going to have to convert them out of halakha to convert them into truth. It's going to be a twofold problem to get people out of your doctrine. So he called them children of hell. He called them uh, whited sepulchers. He called them snakes. He had many names for them. Paul, when he ran into Elimus in the 13th chapter of Acts, over on the island of Cyprus, over on Cyprus, when he ran into him over there, he said, Thou child of the devil. Now, some people say you shouldn't call these people names. If they're lying to the sheep, leading them astray, I'm going to call them down. People have gotten upset at me for calling people's names in the pulpit. Well, Paul said, there's two, two preachers, two young preachers over there, Timothy, that's in your church at Ephesus, and they're preaching a doctrine that eats like a canker. The word is gangrene. And he said, Be, beware of these people. He said, there's a man over there in Ephesus. His name is Alexander. He said, I, I, confronted the, I was confronted by the people at Ephesus the last time I was there, and Alexander this preacher in the church stood with these pagans against me. He said, beware of Alexander. And he tells Timothy, he says, there's two men, Homogenes and Phygelus. Watch out for them. And John says in 3 John, there's a man named Diotrephes. He loves the preeminence. When I get there, I'm going to remember him and tell him so. You see, I believe in calling people down, but when you do, People say, that's, uh, that's not uh, biblically correct. Yes, it is. They'll say, that's not politically correct. Yes, well, it's not politically correct, but we're not supposed to be politically correct. Now, we're talking about these. these I, I've given the Baptist a hard time because the Baptist, the Baptist preach accept Christ, and that's not true. Accept Christ when you're dead in your sin. The Bible says you cannot accept Christ. To first, uh, first Corinthians two fourteen, the natural man, the man of the senses, the physical man. Sukikos is the word. He can't receive spiritual thing. Receive dekomai means to reach out the ten fingers and accept an offer that's been presented. The Bible says dead men don't accept anything spiritual. And then the Baptists preach. They preach uh, drinking. Drinking grape juice, drink grape juice, and eating crackers. That's all I that's what I call it. It is not communion. Communion is the word koinonia. And that's the word that Paul used when he said that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. And that's also the word communion. It's the word fellowship. It means to commune, and that's what we're doing right here, right now. It's the word fellowship. It's either fellowship or it's a form of it, koinonia or koinoneo, and several other variations. It means fellowship or partaker. We are partakers of the Word of God here and now. Partakers. Well, I'm spelling wrong. I'm writing too fast. Partakers. 
and and I go through the Baptists. They got all this other. Uh, they've got to uh, accept Christ. Sinner's prayer. That's terrible. Sinner's prayer for salvation is not true. The blind man said, "We know that God heareth not sinners." The one that was healed by Jesus, when the Pharisees accused Jesus of being a sinner for healing on the Sabbath, he said, "God doesn't hear sinners. If a man has to be a worshiper of God." And do the will of God in order for God to hear him. Well, you can't do that when you're dead in sin. And Jesus, of course, the method of salvation is belief. It's not accept Christ. It is not a sinner's prayer. Uh, Paul says, in the verse everybody goes to, they go to two verses. The Baptists go to this. They go to Luke 18, where the publican, well, where the publican, uh, Went into, he smote his breast and said, God be merciful to me, a sinner. And he went away justified, but that's not the method of salvation. The publican had to be believing God before he could smite his breast. And the Bible says in Romans 10, 13, Romans 10, 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, but how shall they call on him in whom they've not believed? Belief is the method of salvation. That's what Paul told the Philippian jailer. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. But belief is not mere mental assent. Believe in faith is the same word. Believe is the verb. Faith is a noun. Believe is the word pistuo. Faith is the word pistis. It's just the one is the noun. So whatever faith is, that's what believing is doing. Well, faith cometh by hearing and hear and obey are the basic same word in the Greek, the exact same word in the English. So, so it's what we do. And I've gone through these things on the Baptist. I thought I'd throw a little bit of Baptist error in there. That's not true. And then we're talking about the Charismatics. You say, Jim, why are you saying all this? Because the Bible says that the day of the Lord will not come except there come a falling away first. I believe we're in the great falling away. Falling away is the word apostasis. I believe the Baptists have fallen away from the truth. I was talking to a 86-year-old man out of out of Oklahoma City yesterday. He called me and he said, "Thank you for teaching me to learn about Jesus." I was so moved by his testimony. He said, "I've never heard anybody like you." He said, "I was raised in a Baptist home. I started teaching in a Baptist Sunday school in 1953." He said, "I taught Sunday school for 50 years and I didn't learn about who Jesus was till I heard you and he said I have learned more listening to you than I've learned my whole life and he's 86 I was very very touched by that very humbled by that yet I'll get arguments from young men that'll give me a fit over the things we teach and here's a man that's been a believer for many years he said I just never heard these things and he said I try to tell the people at my church about predestination and they just don't want to hear it. He said, if you ever come to Oklahoma, please come and see me. I said, I will. And it, it was so, after people will fight me over and over, to hear an old man like that, not far from where I am now, but hear an old man like that say, you've taught me about Jesus. That was very humbling. And we're talking about the charismatics. There's a falling away, and this old fellow knew that. He said, we're, we're there, yet there's no truth out there anywhere. Falling away, apostasis, comes from apo and stasis. Stasis has many derivatives, staros, S-T-A-U-R-O-S, S-T-A-U-R-O-O, S-T-A-S-I-S, S-T-A-O, Staros is the word cross. Starao is the word crucify. Stasis means to stand. And we also get the word histame, or H-I-S, there's the breathing sound. Histame, and this word means to be, mean to be firm and upright. It means to be upright. upright and you have the word stao means a stake which was upright and the cross was actually a stake 
with a cross piece on it. This was this this was the patibulum. Uh, this was the stipes. This was the patibulum. And we get the word staros, which is the word cross. So apostasis, which is our word apostasy. Apostasy means a removal of stasis, standing upright. It means a removal of the daily cross, even a removal of Jesus' cross. The removal of Jesus' cross. I thought everybody talked about Jesus' cross. Doesn't the Catholics talk about Jesus' cross? Not really. Does the Baptist talk about Jesus' cross? Not really. Does the Church of Christ talk about Jesus' cross? Not really. Do the Assembly of God and the Pentecostals talk about Jesus' cross? Not really. What do you mean, Jim? Because Jesus' cross was for his elect family, for his wife, his church. If you talk about the cross of Christ, that was his death, wasn't it? Who did he die for? Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself. The, new, the King James Bible says gave himself for it, and that's a bad translation. You mean you know more than the translators on this word I do? The word is A-U-T, Ada. It's a form of A-U-T-O, which is the word him or self. And we get, when the Bible says, let a man deny himself, E-A-U-T-O-M-A-I, -E I believe it is. But it's a form. Denying self is a form of him. And this A-U-T-A-D-A, let him, if any man will, uh, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself, not for it, Ephesians 5.25, for her. Because it's feminine gender. So if Jesus died on his cross, for his wife only, and he didn't die for the man in hell, in order to preach the cross of Christ, you have to preach an exclusive cross, don't you? Huh? Can somebody? You have to preach an exclusive. His cross was exclusively for his wife, not for everybody in the world. So when you preach the cross of Christ, and you do not preach that it was for his wife only, he didn't die for the man in hell. The man in hell is dying for his own sin, right? If the man in hell is dying for his own sin, then Jesus didn't die for him. Was his atonement limited? It was limited to his wife. Was it sufficient for everybody in the world? If he had wanted it to be, but he didn't want everybody. He didn't love everybody. He loved his wife, the church, and died for her. He loved Jacob and hated Esau before they were born. So if they do not preach the exclusive cross of Christ, they're not preaching the cross of Christ, are they? You can't just say uh, his cross was every human being that ever lived. No, it was not. You're preaching the wrong cross. And they, so this is a removal. There's a removal of predestination, isn't there? That would be the part of the apostasy, wouldn't it? Huh? You see what I'm saying? Y'all see what I'm saying there? The apostasy would be a removal of predestination and election because he only elected his family, didn't he? And he elected us to obedience and the sprinkling of blood. Sprinkling of blood. Well, if he elected us to obey him, 1 Peter 1 and 2, to obedience, well, only his family is going to obey him because he's going to scourge us and conform us to Christ's likeness. Predestination has been removed from the doctrines of the Bible by just about everybody, and the Baptists used to preach it 150 years ago. All the presidents of the Southern Baptist Convention back in the 1800s preached, believed predestination of the Southern Baptist Convention, and none of them not hardly any of them believe it now. And if they believe it, they believe it in a light form. They preach. What they preach is predestination. Light. 
It's kind of like Bud Light. I never drank Bud Light, but I hear it won't make you drunk unless you drink a lot of it. Well, predestination light won't make you anybody too confused. Just kind of let them off the hook. It's like being on a merry-go-round, and you slow it down so the free willers can step off real easy. I've got the merry-go-round going around real fast, and it's throwing them off. I don't believe in cutting slack. So apostasy is a removal of not only the daily cross, but the cross of Christ because it was exclusive. It's a removal of crucifying self. It's, a, it's even a removal of crucifying Christ for his wife. It's a removal of standing upright and being an upright person or stake. It's a removal of the stake which Christ was on, which we die on, which is the upright piece. It's a removal of uprightness, standing in truth. And when you get into uprightness, you get into stereo, S-T-E-R-E-O, stereos, and you get into many other words that are, there's many words that are variations in the morphemes, morpheme, meaning word shapes, many of the words in the word shapes of this right here. So, the apostasy is here among the Baptists, the Pentecostals. Pentecostals were founded on apostasy. There's no tongues. No such thing as tongues. I keep saying this. There's no such thing as faith healing. And I hate to explain it every time I stand up here. If I do explain it, it's for the camera, not for you, because I know you know this, those of you here. When the Bible says, Thy faith has made thee whole to the woman with the issue of blood, faith made whole. Then Jesus said, Now go be whole of thy plague. Her faith did not cure her of her plague because the second word whole is hugius. Hugius, we get the word hygiene from this. And it means physically cleansed. Physically cleansed. But she wasn't physically cleansed because of her faith. The first word is the word sozo. That's the word saved. She was saved because of her faith. And Jesus says, I'm a living God. You come and touch me, you're going to be healed. She was reaching out. She believed God, but she wasn't believing him to be healed. She was believing. She said, if I can touch the hem of his garment, I will be whole. And she used the word sozo. I'll be saved. What do you mean saved? What were they looking for? Saved. They were being ruled by Rome over here. Everybody in the first century ruled by Rome. And Rome was oppressing the world and slaughtering and killing people all over the world. They thought nothing of killing the Jews. And the Jews was the thorn in the side of the Romans. And in Galilee, there in the 13th chapter of Luke, the writer Luke tells us that Pilate offered some of the people of Israel on the altars he actually killed him on the altars in northern Galilee, and that's when he that when he made the statement, "Except you repent, you'll all likewise perish." Do you think those people were worse than you? They weren't worse because they were killed. That was what Pilate wanted to do, and that's what the Romans did. And they were wanting to be delivered or saved from the Romans. And she believed that Jesus was the Messiah, and he said, "Since you touched me." I'm going to physically cleanse you. Go and be physically cleansed of the earth plague, but your faith has saved you. doesn't say thy faith has made thee physically cleansed. doesn't say that. Now, and you know, I get real detailed. I get mathematical and, and uh, I get uh, analytical in my teaching. I find that when I try to teach somebody something, they say, well, tell me what this means over here. I say, first of all, let's go back over here at the beginning. Well, I don't want that part. I can't explain, I said to Mike today, you can't not explain, what do you call them, systematic equations, Mike? Simultaneous. Simultaneous equations. I took some of that in college, I don't remember it. But I, you can't, unless you go through the entire means, you can't get to the answer. And I've found that people don't want all the details of an understanding of demons or saved or anything else. They want, well, just give me the answer. What do you think about this? I can't tell you what I think. I never tell you what I think. I say, let's start over here in the Bible. Let's work our way through. 
And let me, let me weave this, this great mosaic together for you. But do you know most people don't even want that in a conversation? I have people asking me questions all the time about the Bible. I say, before we can get to that, we have to talk about this over here. Because I want you to have an understanding. I'm not going to just say, well, it's this way or this way. I'm not going to do that. Don't ask me a question if you don't want a long explanation. Just like mathematics. It takes a long explanation to get through some of this. Just like we was talking about demons. We don't believe in demons. Gave that explanation on a mini message right before the message tonight. So all these people are involved in no stereos, no stao, no stasis. This is why I'm calling these people down. I don't hear hardly any truth coming from any area. We've been talking about the charismatics. Charismatics believe in this positive confession. They take verses and twist them, like if you say to this mountain, be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea. I put that so many times on messages, I'll say it to you real quick. A mountain was the capital city of an empire. They were arguing with Jesus for having killed a fruit tree. Jesus had cursed a tree, but you had to understand it was against Jewish law to kill fruit trees. And, but it had to be five years old. It was against the Jewish law. The last two verses of Deuteronomy, the 20th chapter, it was against law to kill a fig fruit tree anywhere, even your enemy's fruit tree. They call that the substance of life. Unless the tree was five years old or older, not bearing fruit, then it was barren, and you laid the axe of the tr- root of the tree and destroyed it. Jesus cursed the fig tree because it wasn't bearing figs and, and it had leaves. But leaf season came after the first figs came on. There should have been pre-season figs. So when he cursed the tree, Peter starts arguing with him. You killed a fruit tree. Don't you know what you did? You, you went against the law. Well, Peter forgot that in the 19th chapter of Leviticus that if a tree was five years old, not bearing fruit, it had to be killed. Jesus was God. He was in this this house of olives, Beth Fage, which means house of olives, and it had many, it had maybe hundreds of fig trees there. He knew, being God, he knew how the fig tree was, and he killed it. And Jesus said, and Peter rebuked Jesus, and Jesus said, if you'll say to this mountain, a mountain being a capital city of an empire, and and Babylon was a destroying mountain, she was a proud mountain, God says, I'm going to make you a burnt mountain. That's a quick synopsis of that. And he said, if you'll say to this mountain, be there removed. And they, they pick up on say, but the mountain was the mountain of self. Babylon was founded on let us make us a name. And she was the mother of all idolatry. Boom. Just like, but who's going to study all that? And they'll go into, they'll go into Romans, the fourth chapter. Uh, they'll say it's positive confession. If you'll say, they say if you say to a mountain of debt. He will say to a mountain of problems in your life, you can remove them. That's not what that's about. They've got all this, they'll say in Romans 4, that God calls things to be not as though they were. Something that was not was something that was dead. And he called Isaac and Abraham, consider not his own body now dead, neither the deadness of Sarah's womb. But he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief. He said, I believe you. God called Isaac from the dead loins of his father in the dead womb of his mother well they say calling things that be not as positive vibrations coming from your mouth that's not what that's about everything that's going on everything is about the will of God isn't it everything election we elected to obey God and the sprinkling of blood a blood baptism was death, was a martyrdom or a death. So we're elected to die to self and do the will of God, aren't we? Prayer, prosukomai, comes from pros, pros and UK. And that means, pros means toward, UK means to will. So prayer means to will oneself towards the will of another or to bow to the will of of God if you take a daily cross if any man will come after me let him deny himself and take up his cross daily you die to self you speak truth you live godly and righteously die to self and you do the will of God everything 
you can go anywhere. When you deny self, you do the will of God, don't you? You can take any subject you want to, and the point is, there's none that seeketh after God. So if God does not pick himself a family and put him through fire and trials and call them to bow to his will, nobody's going to bow to the will of God, are they? You can take any theology that we study here. A blood baptism. Blood baptism. It's when a man, God has dealt with a man, he's willing to take his cross, he's willing to live in truth, and people will hate it when you live in the fact that predestination is true, Christmas is pagan. You'll live in truth, and you'll bow to the will of God. It doesn't matter what God's going to do to a family that he's picked out. There's an exact number, and the rest of the world of vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. He's going to cause his family to bow to the will of God. You're going to say, bow to the will of God. That's the very crux of everything, isn't it? Take any subject you want, anywhere, and everything is about the will of God, and those people that are vessels of wrath, they don't have God's Word written in their heart, and they're never going to bow to it. And we're predestined to conform to the image of Christ. Image, icon, means likeness. So we're predestined to, to conform to Christ's likeness. So that's bowing to the will of God, isn't it? Any subject is about bowing to God's will. Now, we've been talking about one of the charismatic doctrines. I'm going to get on with it right here. They talk about that God wants all of his family to be rich. They'll say, you're king's kids. And it, that galls me when I hear them say that because they're going right straight to a subject. They say, king's kids. Now, they use this like it's a very cliche. King's kids, like it's a very light thing. And they'll say, king's kids are supposed to have all that the king has. King's kids. Kids' kids. <laughs> right and too fast. And they'll say all king's kids need to have everything the king has. And they need to inherit the king's fortunes. And they say the king's fortunes they say the king's fortunes is in this world. That is money, it's stuff, it's cars, it's houses, it's lands, it's IRAs, it's investments, it's riches and wealth. But Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. Didn't he? John 18. And he said, if my kingdom were this world, then would my servants have swords or machine guns? And they would be fighting people, shooting them down. It's not of this world. The kingdom of God is righteousness and peace, the Bible says. And the kingdom of God is in you. Well, if, if the kingdom of God is in you, kingdom of God was an old ancient term for Israel. The kingdom of God is in you, and we're Jews of the heart. Well, if the kingdom of God is in you, and it's literal... It wouldn't be these things if it was literal. If the kingdom of God is in you, it would be blood vessels and corpuscles and, and white corpuscles and red corpuscles. And so when he died, you'd have to get a bunch of red corpuscles and a bunch of enzymes and, and, uh, and what's that tissue you're made of? Uh, protoplasm. So you inherit protoplasm when you die, when he died. No. That's what it would be if it was literal, wouldn't it? He said, my kingdom's not of this world. It's in you. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. They said where the king was and Christ is in us, that's where the kingdom was. Now, what do God's, what do God's children, what do God's children inherit? Now, we've been taught, well, if you're a child, you're going to inherit 
your father's last will. Huh? Last will. What? Last will. That's right. You're gonna you're gonna inherit your father's last will and testament. What he's left you is what you're gonna inherit. Now, you can't demand while your father and mother's alive, you can't demand your inheritance. Can you? Eric cannot come to me and Mary and say, okay, I'm inheriting your house and your cars. I want them today. Well, Eric, what are we going to do? Well, that's tough. I'm inheriting it. Well, not till we're dead. And isn't that what the Bible says in Hebrews 9? Look at that one more time. I want to go through this real slow. Now, I've gone through this, but I want you to see how important this is to understand. Hebrews 9. I haven't really covered all this like I want to. I need to slow down. Hebrews, the ninth chapter. <clears throat> all right. Hold on a second here. Let me... All right, Hebrews, the ninth chapter. All right, ninth chapter. In verse, verse uh, 15. For this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament. Now, we've said before that the word testament is the word diatheke, D-I-A-T-H-E-K-E. -E. And every time you find the word covenant in the New Testament, same word, diatheke. Diatheke means last will and testament. Now it says here he is the the mediator. Now a mediator is a go between, and I'll explain to you what that means. He is the mediator. Mesites, m e s i t e s, m e s i t e s. Let me write this down. M e s. Mesites is the word mediator. It means a go be tween. What does that mean, a go between? It's one who arbitrates. Now, arbitrates. An arbitrator is one who's. Huh? A R. An arbitrator is one who stands between two people who are at odds. And he, he's a representative of the lesser person like a lawyer. And he's trying to mediate between the wrath of the court upon this particular person. Where did that come from? They said in the Old Testament they had to cut a covenant. Now, a covenant in the Old Testament is the word berith, B-E-R-I-Y-T-H. That's the word covenant. The covenant that God made with Israel, they said, had to be cut. This word meant to pass between the pieces. A covenant is a promise. God picks out a people and promises, and there is, a, there is something between us and God. Well, the mediator is the one, here's God, and here is his sheep down here. There has to be one who speaks for us, speaks for us as our lawyer, as one who steps in between us and God, and we're under condemnation until this one says, 
This one is mine. My blood was shed for this one. And he mediates for us. And a mediator is one who speaks on behalf of another. It's not the Mary of Roman Catholicism. Look over here in, just stop and go over here to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5. For there is one God and one mediator, one mesotase. There's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. It's not uh, the Virgin Mary. And she wasn't a perennial virgin. She had other children. The mediator is Christ Jesus. Isn't that what it says? The go-between. They would actually take two... When they would have a covenant, they would kill an animal. They'd cut it in two pieces. And they would walk between the pieces. Actually walk through. That was a contract depicting a mediator, a go-between between the two. That was a picture of, of Jesus between God and us and the wrath of God and how it was appeased by the blood of Christ and it was only a, the blood was only applied to the sheep. Right? That's what a mediator. Now let's go back over here to Hebrews the ninth chapter. Now you know what a mediator is. That's the same word when he says, for this cause he is the mediator, verse 15, of the new last will and testament. There was an old last will and testament in the Old Testament. But this is a better testament or a better covenant. This one is spiritual. It is the very image, Hebrews 10 and 1, the very image, the one over here was the shadow. The law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image. The law was the skia. It was the shade. It wasn't the real thing. Passing between the pieces wasn't the real thing. The real thing is over here, Jesus mediating for us between God and his, his sheep. He's mediating and saying, this one's mine. I've covered him with my blood. I died in his place. Instead of your wrath coming upon him, he's mine. That's a mediator. But notice when the mediator, when the testament takes place. Let's continue reading. For this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, this is how a mediator comes about in this case. By means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament. The first testament was thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not uh, have any other gods before me, thou shalt not commit uh, murder, thou shalt not. It's all the shalt nots. So the first testament, the mediator was for the first testament. They which are called, now notice this, they which are Kaleo. Is everybody Kaleo called? No. Ekklesia is the word church. It means called, Kaleo, out. Ek. Get the word exit from that. So we're called out of this world, and that's the church. So when he's talking about the called, He's not talking about everybody. Look at, hold your place here, and look at 1 Peter, the second chapter. I'm not going to go through the whole thing. I'm going to come back to it. But he says here, Peter is talking to the church, and he says here in verse 21, For even hereunto were ye called. And he goes into a list of what you're called to. You were called. The called, those that are, every time you see the called, always think of church. We know that all things work together for good, Romans 8 and 28. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are 
the called according to his purpose. Now it will say in a King, not in a King James Bible, it will say in the original text, we know that all things work together for them that love God to them who are called according to his purpose. The definite article is not there, but the reason the translators put it there and they did something right this time is because there's a definite article eliminates any other called. There's only one called. There's only one church. The church is the body, and how many bodies are? There's one body. So therefore, there's one body, Ephesians 4 and 5. There's one church. There's one call. So even though the is not in the original text, you have to put it there because there's only one call. That's the church, right? Can you see that? So the, the translators put to them who are the called, them who are the kaleo. All things work together for good to the church. That's what it's saying. All things work together for good to the call. So, where was I? Ecclesia, called. Well, let's get back over here. Let's get back over to Hebrews. And he says here, they which are called, you could put they which are the called, because there's only one called in one church, right? Receive, might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. I want you to notice something. When I'm reading, I'll pull out certain words in verses to get the full meaning of it. Now, what does it say? The called receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Called promise eternal inheritance so everywhere you find promise if it refers to some other word that's going to be part of the inheritance isn't it called would be the church so anywhere you find inheritance or inherit Or heir. Remember those words? Let me write them down on the board again. And I take one word. I look at every verse where it's used. And I connect any other word with that word. So we see that the called have the promise. And they have the inheritance. Don't they? Huh? Isn't that right? So think called. Promised. Inheritance, right? Well, they would also be the heirs and sons are heirs, aren't they? You inherit the kingdom of your father. You inherit your father's. You don't inherit money. That's not the kingdom of God. King's sons don't inherit money. They inherit the promise, eternal inheritance. Now, remember the words... Clero, N-O-M-E-O. -E that is the common word, inherit. Then you have the word, kleronomia. Kleronomia is the common word, inheritance. So everywhere you find these words, and you have the common word, Heir, the common word heir is clero nomos. This is the word heir. If you notice, they're constructions of the same word. Each one of them comes from kleros, which means a portion, and nomos which is the Greek word law. It means a lawful portion. What's lawful is to the sons, isn't it? Right? So everywhere you find called, promise, everywhere you find church, promise, inheritance, sons, inherit, 
from their father, then what you're going to have, you're going to add a whole bunch of other words to this list right here. In fact, stop a minute and go to, go to uh, Ephesians, the first chapter. Let's add another word to this, okay? And we'll come back here. And I, I brought a lot of this out last week. But what I'm doing is going slow this week so you can see it. Now here in Ephesians, the first chapter, speaking in verse 11, Paul said, In whom we have obtained a lawful portion and inheritance. A lawful portion and inheritance. And that word is clero or clerao. Clarao means a portion or an inheritance. It means we have obtained an assigned. We have been assigned an inheritance. We've been assigned something. Now, when you're assigned something, I wrote the word assigned down on a paper here. And, and I did a definition on it. When you're assigned something, if you're at work and you're assigned, let me show you how you do this. Look, always keep a Webster's Dictionary around any time. So if I'm going to look at something, I'll open up my Webster's Dictionary. Now, what does assign mean? A-S-S-I-G-N. It's more than a lot of people realize. S. Now, what you do is open your Webster's and find out. You say, I know what a sign means. You're assigned something. You do it. Just listen to me. H-I-S-S-I-G-N. All right. A sign. To set apart or mark for a special purpose. We have been assigned... We have been set apart, haven't we? And we've been marked. This is the word assigned. Set apart. What would be a Greek word that means to set apart? What's the common Greek word means to set? Huh? No, that means to set apart. Well, that would be one word. Aporizo. What would be another word? Huh? Hagiazma. Hagiazo. H A G I A Z O. This word, aporizo, comes from apo, meaning setting off a horizo. Remember the word prohorizo is the word predestinate. It means to be forebound. And aporizo is the word separate. Paul said, God has separated me unto the gospel in the first chapter of Galatians. He has separated me. How did he separate us? Well, he put us through fire and trials. He birthed us by his will to begin with. And then he sets us apart through fire and trials so we'll be like Jesus, doesn't he? Like Jesus. Well, this word hagiazo is the word sanctify. Sanctify. And it means to set apart. It's also the word hallowed. And from hagiazo we get hagios, which is the word holy. And the way you become holy or pure, you have to go through the fire and burn out the impurities in our lives. And that's what God puts us through. So if we are assigned, if we're assigned something, we have obtained an inheritance, which is a form of, it's a form of inherit, means to set apart, assign, for a particular purpose. Have we been assigned the likeness of Jesus? Well, yeah. So when he says, We've obtained an inheritance being predestinated. So predestinate goes in this line here, doesn't it? 
if we've obtained an inheritance, then in this line you got the church, you got the promise, you got the inheritance, and you've got being assigned an inheritance, you got predestinate. So all these words have to do with each other, don't they? We've obtained an inheritance. Obtained is the word klarao, meaning to be assigned, set apart for something particular, to walk in the likeness of Christ, right? Is, is this too much? No. All right. Now, we've obtained an inheritance. How did we get that? People will say, well, I don't understand. Why would God do that? Because he wants to. Why wouldn't he save everybody? I had a banker ask me the other day, well, that just seems unfair. I said, well, it seems unfair to you, but God don't think like you think. He said, your thoughts aren't my thoughts, and you can't. I told him, I said, you see that door entrance to the bank? He said, yeah. I said, if hell was out there and you could hear people screaming and yelling, you'd pull them out, and so would I, but God won't. That's not like we think, is it? He'll leave them there for eternity. I don't understand that at all. But you know why I believe it? Because the Bible says so. I don't want that to be true. I would like all of my friends and family, even my worst enemies, not to have to go there. But you know what that makes? It makes us human. It makes God. Yeah, it makes, like Mary said, it makes us human and God is God. Now, we've obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the Purpose, prothesis. So pro purpose would go in here, wouldn't it? Right? Purpose, the purpose of God, number five. The purpose of God would go in prothesis. Prothesis comes from pro, meaning before, and tithame. Tithame means to lay out ahead of time. So the purpose of God is the one that has caused our inheritance. Inheritance has to do with predestination, with what we've been assigned to. It's a purpose for a particular people, for a particular duty, and that's the promise of God. Remember, promise is the word ep, A-G-G-E-L-O-S. Angelos is the word angel, but it means messenger. Or message. So God has superimposed epi, the message of God, upon his predestinated inheritance, his sons, that he's purposed for a particular assignment. Now, if you back up to verse 5, <clears throat> having predestinated us unto adoption. Well, adoption belongs there, doesn't it? <clears throat> adoption has to do with sons, doesn't it? Adoption is the word U-I-O-T-H-E-S-I-A. Huyo thesia. There's a little diacritical mark. It has a breathing sound, an H-U-I-O-S, which is the word sons, tithame, means to place sons. It means to place sons. So therefore, adoption has to do with the purpose of God, predestination, inheritance, promise, the called, the church, has been assigned to a particular purpose. Right? Yeah. Now, so we have an inheritance. And what does inheritance have to do with? That has to do after the death. And all of this has to do with after death. Because after death is when you inherit. And a last will and testament, everywhere you find last will and testament, that's the word testament. Everywhere you find testament. Let's go back to Hebrews 9. And finish that, and let's go back over where we ended up last week in Matthew 26. When you're studying, notice, take one word, when it's directly associated with another word, 
Look up where this word, everywhere this word is used. And you can connect it. And this word right here is used in this verse right here. And then when you get in, then you get into these other verses. And whatever this word is connected to, you might have inheritance here. You might have predestinate here. So these words are all going to be associated together. Do you understand what I'm saying? This is how you study. Look at one word. Take your concordance. Look up every time it's mentioned. Thumb through some places in your New Testament. Look at Psalms and Proverbs because these are books on how to live life and Ecclesiastes and see how many times inheritance is used over there and find out what the inheritance is there because the inheritance doesn't change from there to the New Testament, does it? No. Now get back over here to... So we have obtained, an, uh, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. When somebody says, I don't understand why God would do that, take them to Ephesians 1 and 5. Say it's according to the good pleasure of his will. Back down to verse 11, we've obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him who works all things after the counsel of his own will. You're going to have to put counsel in this line. Counsel and will of God. All of this was according to the counsel, Thelema. Thelema means determination. And will of God, Bulemi, purpose. When people say, I don't understand why we're good, I've got to do that, it it's according to his purpose, it's because he determined it. And it's according to the good pleasure of his will. When somebody says, it don't seem right to me that God would predestinate one and ordain others for hell, take them to Ephesians 1, 5 and 1, 11 and tell them it's according to his pleasure, of his, it's on his own pleasure and, it's, and he works all things according to the purpose of him who works all things after the, all things, all things. When it says all things, it means everything in the world is according to the purposes of God, according to the good pleasure of His will. Now, let's go back over to Hebrews. I hope y'all are getting this. I preached a lot of this last week, but I don't think I can get it one time around. Do you? Now, let's go back, and I want to emphasize this. Emphasize this in the ninth chapter of there's some things I want you to see so clear, I'm going to stop and say, let me go through this real slow. Now look at this. Let me erase some of this over here. So, kleronomos, this is an heir. He receives a legal portion because he's a son that's been placed as a son, adopted according to the purpose of him who works all things after the counsel of his own will. So sons receive the inheritance, right? That's why Jesus said to the Pharisees in John 8, the works of your father you will do. He was a liar and a murderer. The works of Satan, he said, your father's the devil. What he's saying, you've inherited lying and murdering. That's what he's telling the Pharisees, and they are, they're infuriated. He said, that's what you get from your father. You see, they believed that if you were a that if your father was a thief, they'd call you a thief. If they said, if your father was a baker, if your father was a baker, they'd call you Bar Baker. The son of the baker. If they said Bar Jonah, that meant the son of Jonah. When Peter Blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah, son of Jonah. That meant that Peter had inherited the estate of his father, Jonah. That's not talking about his literal father being Jonah. Jonah preached repentance to Nineveh, the capital city of the Assyrians, the most barbaric people that ever lived, and he was resurrected from the belly of the fish. 
Peter preached the resurrection of Christ from the grave in Acts 2. And he preached repentance just the way Jonah preached repentance. Peter was. Peter inherited the office of Jonah. If you said, if you said bar John, that meant the son of John or John's son, Johnson. A man named Johnson would be the son of John. And if his father was a butler, he'd be called the son of John the butler. That's the way they would express that. So, we are sons of God, bar God. We inherit his promises. Now, look here again. I, I feel like I'm giving you an awful lot. Maybe I need to slow down. Oh, okay. Now, yeah, need to slow down <laughs> a little bit. Okay. Now, go back to Hebrews 9. Now, he says here, let me read 15 again. For this cause, he is the mediator or the go-between of the New Testament. That's Jesus, not, not the Mary of Roman Catholicism. That by means of death for the redemption and with the redemption, of the transgressions, notice that a mediator has to do with transgressions. Christ is the go-between between us. The go-between in a court of law between the condemned and the judge is the lawyer. The barrister, B-A-R-I-S-T-E-R. -R -R That's what he's called. He's called a lawyer. And the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament they which are called, might, they which are the church, might receive the promise, might receive the epangelo, or have the promise of God superimposed upon their life. And that's only the called of eternal inheritance. You have an inheritance to receive. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. Testator means, it's the word diatithame. The word testament, diatheke, is a derivative of the word d-i-a-t-h-e-k-e. -E. Diatheke, excuse me, diatithame, excuse me. Dia, t-i-t-h-e, t-i-t-h, M-A-I, or T-I-T-H-I-M-A-I. So, diatithame means to put apart, to dispose of, or bequest. Dispose. Most of you probably know that when a will is read after someone is dead, they call that a disposing of the will, right? What you're doing is you're having the final... Uh, reading of the will at an attorney and they're going to dispose it actually means to bequeath means to dispose or bequeath when you go before the lawyer after the death after the probating of the will you go in to the lawyer and he disposes of the goods you get this house you get these cars you get this investment, you get this. That is the disposal of the will, the bequeathing of the will. So when he says here, for a testament, which verse was I in? Okay, for where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator, the one who bequeathed the will. Who bequeathed the will to us? Jesus. He has bequeathed a will, a last will and testament. This is not money like the charismatics say. If you notice, I have to teach on all this to prove that the charismatics don't know what they're talking about. I have to talk about inheritance because they say the inheritance is diamond rings and money and things and stuff. And that's not true. He had to die to leave us eternal life. Well, he had to die to leave us more than that. 
He had to die to leave us death to self. That's what he left us. He didn't leave us diamond rings. He left us a daily cross. And we'll see that. Well, it is eternal life, but the eternal life starts now. Eternal life has to do with the daily cross and death to self and self-denial. We'll see it in a minute. All right. You don't get eternal life when this all is all over. You've already got it. You realize that? You got eternal life right now. Yeah. Well, we didn't get it till he died. That's right, but he's dead and risen from the dead. But he was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So if he's the lamb slain from the foundation of the world in the mind of God, we received it back then. We didn't receive it in our bodies, in our daily living, but it was the thing that was to be. Now try to explain that miraculous understanding of God. I can't. Now, read here. Huh? Yeah, we're saved through the whole thing. That's right. Saved, sozo, means we have been saved, we're being saved, and we shall be saved. It's not something you get one night. It's something we have been, we are, and we shall be. We talked about being saved from wrath of the orge here recently, and the orge is anger of self and rage because we want what we want. We're angry because somebody took something from us, either applause or awards or recognition or money or something. They got our lawnmower and wouldn't bring it back, and they broke it. We had that happen in the church one time. One guy bought another guy's lawnmower. He broke it, and he wouldn't bring it back home because it was broke. <laughs> he didn't fix it and say, here's your lawnmower back. He just didn't bother to bring it back. And that's a little bit on the dishonest side. Now, verse 17. For a testament is of force be by us. It is stable, or B-E-B-A-I-O-S. Remember that word? Remember that word? Besides all this, give all diligence, add to your faith in Second Peter 1 and 5, and he names seven things. And then he says, he that has all these things, he'll never fall. But he said, if you don't have these things, you'll get blind, you forget that you're purged from your old sins, Therefore, make your calling and election sure. The word sure is be by us. It means to stabilize. Stabilize by adding all these seven things. Well, he says, there is no stableness to a testament. After the, for a testament is stable. It has force after men are dead. A last will and testament is only in force after men die, right? And Jesus is the mediator of the New Testament. And, is, it, and otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the diatithome, while the one bequeaths it, is still alive. Now, that's very important. While Jesus was alive, the testament had no force, and it was invalid till he was dead. Now let's go back to where we were last week, over to Matthew 26. Matthew 26. Now I'm going to try to explain this. I'm going to try to be more thorough. You know, when I teach something over and over again, I look at words and I say, how can I explain this? I'm seeing this. How can I get the people to see it? I do this all the time in my mind. And I try to get as simple as I can. Let me get real simple with you what he says here. Regarding what we've already said, the death of the testator, a testament is not a force until he's dead. Correct? All right. They're eating the last Passover. In verse, chapter, how much time do I have, Mike? In chapter 26, verse 2, you know that after two days is the feast of the Passover. Verse 17, last sentence of the verse, 
Where art thou that we prepare for thee to eat the Passover? Verse 18. He said, Go into the city to such a man and send him. My master saith, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at thy house with my disciples. Then he says in the next verse, The disciples did as Jesus appointed them, and made, they made ready the Passover. So they're about to eat the Passover, aren't they? Now when evening was come, the evening of the Passover on Thursday night, we've already said that Jesus died on the preparation, which was Friday. It was called the mother of the Sabbath, or the eve of the Sabbath. Now when the evening was come, he sat down with the twelve, and as they did eat the Passover, let me add that in there, he said, Verily I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. And they were exceeding sorrowful, and began every one of them to say unto him, Lord, is it I? And he answered and said, He that dippeth his hand with me in the dish, the same shall betray me. Now they're eating the Passover, right? And, Jesus, and the Son of Man goeth as it was written of him, but woe unto that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. And people say, well, do you think Judas was saved when he, when he got sorry and went, took the money back and threw it to the Pharisees? No. The Bible says in Mark, the 14th chapter, that it had better that that man had never been born that had betrayed Christ. Now, how in the world, God would never say it's better you were never born if you were a vessel of mercy. He would never say that about a vessel of mercy. And Judas was condemned in the 106th Psalm. And if it, it had been good for that man if he had not been born, it says it right here, doesn't it? God would not say that about a vessel of mercy or one of his elect. Then Judas, which betrayed him, answered and said, Master, is it I? And he said unto him, Thou hast said it. You said it. And as they were eating, what? The Passover. Jesus took bread and blessed it and brake it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is esteem. E-S-T-I-N. This is. E-S-T-I-N. Now our word is is a form of the verb to be. The word be in the Greek text is E-I-N-A-I. -I. It doesn't mean is. Uh, the, and I means is. Esteem doesn't mean is. Esteem means represents. So what he said, this bread represents the body. Remember, they acted out their contracts. Jesus was acting out a contract. The Jews did that all the way back to the beginning. They would perform a contract. In, a, in real estate, I sold real estate for years. They call uh, selling a house, they call getting a contract on it, proceeding with the signing by all parties, agreements, going, to, going through a loan process, going to a loan officer, processing the contract, going to closing. They call that specific performance of a contract. They perform their contracts in the ancient world. We get a real estate term from the ancient world, performing a contract. And they would have a performance. And Jesus said, this bread represents my body. How many bodies are there? One. Ephesians 4 and 5. There's one body. And what is the body? Over there in Colossians 1, 18 and 1, 24. The body is the church. Jesus is saying, this represents my church. That's what he's saying. In this contract, we're performing. He's not saying, eat crackers and drink grape juice. They're eating the Passover, and we're in a spiritual Passover. There was a lamb. Christ is the, our spiritual lamb without blemish. The Bible says Christ, our Passover, is crucified for us there in the fifth chapter of 1 Corinthians. If he's the Passover lamb, and you got four items in a Passover, you got a lamb without blemish, and that's Jesus. You got unleavened bread. And over there in the fifth chapter of 1 Corinthians, 
there's a man in the church that's called the leaven of the Passover, the spiritual Passover, and Paul says, get this man out of the church. All the leaven had to, had to be out of, the, out of the house the morning of the Passover. Well, they had unleavened bread, and we, the church, being many of one bread and one body in 1 Corinthians 10, 17. So the church is the bread. It's not crackers. And then you had four cups, and the third cup was the one that was blessed, and this is the cup of blessing. It was called the cup of blessing. And let me say this about the cup of blessing. We need to put the cup of blessing in the line of all this here. Six, seven, cup of blessing. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? To drink of a cup of blood meant to undergo a death. And watch what he says. Now, cup of blessing, where was I? I got so many things on the board I can't remember. Now, he says, he gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this represents my body, the church. I'm performing a contract. And then he says, and he took the cup and gave thanks. That's the third cup. Let me put it this way. Cup of blessing is in this line. Cup of blessing is the third cup of the Passover. Third cup. And the third cup is the testament. It is the last will. It's the diatheke. It is the last will and testament. So what God has left to you is this cup of blessing. That's what he's left to you. Now look what he says. He took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying, don't drink part of the cup. Drink all of it. Now, what would it all be? Look at the next verse. For this cup is my blood of the new Dithike, last will and testament. Drinking a cup. Is what has been left to you as a last will and testament but it's not any good until the death of the diatithame the testator right and the testator is alive and well sitting right there in front of him saying this cup is the last will and testament when is that cup going to come into effect Well, here it is sometime Thursday night, Thursday night, somewhere between 9 and midnight. Somewhere between 9 and midnight, and Jesus is not going to die till later that day. reason I say later that day is the day begin at 6 o'clock, the Jewish they begin at 6 in the evening and ends at 6 o'clock the next evening. So later that day, he's going to be taken that night by the Roman soldiers and taken to the pavement and stand before Pilate the next morning. And he's going to be crucified somewhere between 12 and 3 o'clock in the afternoon because there'll be darkness from the 6th to the ninth hour of the day and darkness will be upon the earth. His death will occur somewhere here. So when Jesus is saying the night before, this cup, to drink of a cup didn't mean to drink the cup itself. It meant to drink of what's in the cup. And to drink of a cup of blood meant to undergo death. It was an old, ancient Long before Christ, the pagans used it. 
and they would drink of each other's blood. They'd get two cups of wine, they would slit a wrist, and they would, one man would drip his blood in the cup of the other guy, and then this guy would slit his wrist and drip his cup, drink his, drip his blood in this other guy's cup, and they would drink one another's blood, and they said they became friends closer than a brother. And when they did that, they would die for each other. They were actually closer than blood brothers. They said they were closer than milk brothers from the same breast. When they did that, they said, if you die and your enemies come after me, after you, I will stand with you. You die, I die. It was loving one another to the death. And the Bible says Jesus is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. That's why Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. I'm drinking his cup of blood. It was against Jewish law to drink blood there in the book of Leviticus. You couldn't drink blood. But that was an old ancient pagan term, and Jesus used the pagan terms so they would understand what he was talking about. So he says, this cup, I want you to drip your blood in this cup, and that'll be the daily cross. To drink of a cup meant to undergo a death. That is our last will and testament. What you've been left is not diamond rings and money and things and stuff. You've been left a cup. And what is a cup? And you will drink it. Well, drinking of a cup was a death, wasn't it? Death to self. A blood baptism was death to self. Death to self. We've been, we've been elect unto obedience to obey God and the sprinkling of blood. He's washed us from our sins in his own blood. That's the true baptism. Baptized comes from baptizo and bapto. Baptizo means to cover. Bapto means to stain with a dye. Baptized does not mean to dip in water. Absolutely does not. Any of you Greek teachers out there know that. I'm pointing at the camera. It does not. Originally baptized was an infinitive. It was a verbal noun. An infinitive is a noun with verbal character. It's like the barn is to be painted. They usually prefix an infinitive in the English with to be painted. You don't dip the barn into the paint, do you? Get a giant and dip the barn down in the paint. You splash the paint on the barn. The action ha in an infinitive, the action has to come from an outer source. It doesn't come from the, the subject being dipped into anything. An outer source comes upon the subject and sprinkles it with a stain or a dye. That's what baptized means. So a baptism is the same thing as drinking a cup, isn't it? Look at that over in Mark. Go to Mark. Mark, the 10th chapter. Verse 35. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came unto Jesus, saying, Master, we would that thou shouldest do for us whatever we want. Well, that's the wrong way to approach Jesus. That's not buying to the will of God. Were these guys, did they have some sin in their life? Yeah. They were proud, weren't they? Yeah, they were. And he said unto them, What would you that I should do for you? They said unto Jesus, Grant unto us that we may sit one on the right hand and the other on thy left hand in thy glory. <laughs> Boy, what pride. We want the front seats in heaven by you, okay? Well, what about Moses? And what about Abraham? What about Paul? What about, all, what about Elijah? What about how many? What about John the Baptist? But Jesus said to them, you don't even know what you're asking you know not what you ask. Can you drink the cup that I drink of? 
Can you be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with? Do you think Jesus is saying, are you able to drink grape juice and be dipped in water? No, he's going to die the next day. He said, can you die the death? When Jesus said this cup is the New Testament, he can't be talking about something they're doing that night. He's talking about something that's going to happen after 3 o'clock the next day when he's dead. Drink the cup after I'm dead because you can't drink a cup before I die and have it be a testament. There has to be a death of the testator, doesn't there? Before the covenant is any count. The covenant is only in effect after he's dead later that day somewhere after 3 o'clock, isn't it? Huh? Can anybody see that? Can you see that? I look at Lisa because she's been in charismatic moving a lot in her life and this is something she heard that she didn't hear, and she heard all this. She actually came up to me one night and said, "You can in this series on charismatics, can you talk about that thing about where they talk about king's kids deserve uh, all these things and stuff? You know, that's why I brought this part in the message. And what it did, it brought me to all of this. So when Jesus said this cup is the New Testament, he's not talking about drinking grape juice that night or even after he's dead, is he? He's not talking about, okay, now I'm going to be dead somewhere about 3 o'clock tomorrow. We'd call it tomorrow. I'm going to be dead at 3 o'clock tomorrow. Be sure and get together and drink some grape juice, okay? And they're not eating crackers and drinking grape juice. They may be eating the Passover that night. But he's talking about when he was nailed to the cross the next day. Colossians 2.14 blotting out the handwriting of ordinances. When he was nailed to the cross, all rituals were blotted out, the Passover rituals were blotted out, and the Passover became spiritual. Jesus is the Passover lamb, the church is the bread, the cup of blessing is death to self, and bitter herbs, they called drinking wormwood a bitter herb, and they would dip the bread into the bitter herb, and that was a bowl sitting in the middle of the table. And they call that, if you look up wormwood in your Bible, in your concordance, every time you find it, it's talking about Israel going through fire and trials. So he's not talking. As soon as he's nailed to the cross, that's when the New Covenant or the New Testament or the last will and testament comes into effect when the testator is dead the next day. We'd call it the next day. It was the same day to them since their day began at 6 and ended at 6. So sometime after, after 12, he's nailed to the cross. He's not looking down off the cross and saying, y'all get your break, grape juice with you, be sure to drink it when I'm dead. <laughs> you say, Jim, why are you making fun of him? Because that's how ridiculous that is. Nobody even bothers to look up testament, do they? And look at what Jesus says over here. And a cup. I don't even have time to go into it. Look up cup. Out of your McClinic and Strong. I got a copy of cup. And I'm going to continue on this next week. Cup. He talks about Paul using the expression to refer to the Jews. Cup of blessing the third of four cups at, by the Jews at the Paschal Feast. See, I didn't make that up. It comes out of McClinic and Strong. It also comes out of, out of Edersheim's books. But in the far majority, he talks about a cup of, uh, he talks about cups all through here, cup of consolation, cup of salvation. That's what we drink of. Talks about the cup of blessing. And he says, but in, in by far the majority of passages, the cup is the cup of astonishment, a cup of trembling, the full red flaming wine cup of God's wrath and retribution. He says, I'm going to make the world drink of, of the cup of the wine of my wrath. So everybody's going to drink of some cup. And then he goes on to say, there is in fact in the prophets no more frequent or terrific image and it is repeated with pathetic force in the language of our Lord's agony. And Jesus said, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. The night before he died, when he was in the garden in, in agony in his priestly prayer. 
He wouldn't say, let this grape juice pass from me, was he? It was idiomatic language. God is here represented as the master of a banquet, dealing the madness and stupor of vengeance to guilty guests. The cup thus became an obvious symbol of death. So that's our last will and testament, isn't it? This cup is the last will and testament, and hence the oriental flurries to taste death. There'll be many here, Jesus said, that will not taste death till they see Christ coming in his kingdom and the kingdom of God is in us and that came in Acts 2. Then he goes on to say, the custom of giving a cup of wine and myrrh to condemn criminals is alluded to in Matthew. But I love that where he says the cup became an obvious symbol. It became an obvious symbol of death. Hence, the oriental phrase and by the way, Orient means East, and Israel was the first Orientals. Do I have any time? Two minutes. Look over here in Matthew 26. Did I finish that? This cup is the New Testament. And listen, but go back to chapter 26 of Matthew. For this cup, is the blood of the new last will and testament. And after I die later this day or tomorrow by our timing, that's when it'll take effect. Not tonight. We're not going to eat crackers and drink grape juice. That's why we don't believe in so-called communion that the Baptists do or the Church of Christ do. The Church of Christ say if you don't do communion every Sunday in a Church of Christ, you're going to hell. You have to be baptized by a Church of Christ preacher. The Baptists say the crackers and grape juice is a picture and a type of the death of Christ. No, it's not. The picture of the death of Christ is us taking the cup and dying daily, isn't it? That's a picture of the daily cross. Which Now, this cup of the New Testament is shed for many for the remission of sins. Remission is the same word as forgiveness, aphesis, to pardon and release us from prison. You're not pardoning and release from prison by drinking a cup of grape juice, are you? It's re it's, I don't know why nobody ever studies this and sees it. So when we get into drinking a cup, we're in the last will and testament after the death of Jesus. What can I say? That's what we've inherited. A testament after the death of the taste or you're bequeathed the cup. Not diamonds and rings and cars and houses. You've got your inheritance. It's called a cup. How does that come about? It's the same thing as a daily cross. It's the same thing as a blood baptism. Jesus said, I have a baptism to be baptized with. He says that after he has been washed in water, a proselyte baptism. There's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. He's washed us from our sins in his own blood. Baptism is either H2O or it is blood. But a blood baptism, baptism is a cup, isn't it? And Jesus said, I have this baptism to be baptized with in, he, in Luke, the 12th chapter. How am I held together till it be accomplished? He'd already been washed in a proselyte water baptism, and I go through that too. I go through the proselyte washing of the of the uh, Ethiopian unit. I said earlier, I'm out of time, but I said earlier, people want me to explain communion. I say, well, we have to go back here to a covenant. Well, I don't know that. Just what the, what is this crackers and grape juice about? Well, let me explain it like I did tonight, okay? Well, I don't want to hear all that. Well, I can't explain a cup until we explain a testament. I can't explain a testament till we explain last will and testament, till we explain bequeathing, till we explain the death of Christ. I can't explain that until I go into this, all the rest of this that we've gone into. So king's children do not inherit money and things and stuff. They inherit a cup. They inherit death to self. That doesn't sound like that charismatic doctrine. And if you noticed, I moved out of charismatic doctrine into the theology of the so-called communion, so-called sacraments of the church, 
How can there be baptism when there's one baptism? He's washed us from our sins in his own blood. And baptized means to cover with a stain or die. How can there be water involved in this? It's not. We will never dip anybody in water. Do you think that makes you any less spiritual not to be dipped in water? Oh, you're not as spiritual as some Baptist down here believes in free will because he got dipped in water. It's ridiculous, isn't it? Don't Let's, you think we should do it just to make sure? <laughs> <laughs> I, did get a, I did get a letter to that effect. Did Don't you think we ought to do it to make sure? That's kind of like... Well, let's believe Billy Graham and Kenneth Copeland and you, Jim Brown, just in case one of you might be right. That's DC Diamond Esteros. I perceive in all things are too, su too superstitious. You have a fear of all the gods. Let's embrace them all, they said at Athens, just in case one of them might be right. We'll take yours too, Paul, and put him up here on a shelf with the rest of them. If you go into Shintoism, they may have 800 gods on a shelf in their little cubicles. If you say, would you like to accept Christ? Yeah, give me a statue of him. I'll put him up here. That's what they'll do. I'll worship him along with these, all these other gods, just in case one of them's right. Let's pray. Father, thank you for truth. Lord, I don't know what to do sometimes other than keep preaching. Help us to continue this work. Lord, all of our enemies that would destroy us, we turn them over to you, Lord. I can't fight them. Fight our battles for us like David said. Plead our cause. Mature the flock. Let his cheer elect. Continue this ministry. You start it. You will finish it. And Lord, open up many doors. I'll keep teaching this till I die. Or till I fall dead. We'll praise you for all things. In Christ's name we pray, man. Well, that's a lot of stuff. I don't even know if I understand it. <laughs> Whew. I like moving out of... Was that hard or did it? It is interesting to know that Jesus said... The Bible says there won't be a last will and testament until the man who wrote the testament is dead. It's like you can't go inherit your parents' property until they're dead. So they're trying to say, he's saying drink some grape juice here. Well, if that's the testament, that really... The Baptist church had this table sitting out in front of the podium. And across the front in remembrance of me. Well, the, the Bible says that the... Once a month. Once a month. Lest I forget Gethsemane. Lest I forget thine agony.